From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. There are two common questions that come up with continuous no-till operations. How deep should I sample soils for pH? And how should lime be applied if the soil is acidic and the field needs lime? K-State Nutrient Management Specialist Dorvar Ruiz-Diaz has the answers. We'll have that in just a moment. Also, K-State researchers have been evaluating cover crop management options in water-limited environments. At last week's Cover Crop Field Day, K-State agronomist Augustina Bohr covered some of the research being conducted at the K-State HB Ranch near Hayes. And Gus Vanderhoven stops by with this week's Stop, Look, and Listen. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Hello, this is Bill Curtis on behalf of the National Weather Service. Being a native Kansan, I know that springtime can bring life-threatening weather in the form of tornadoes. If the National Weather Service issues a tornado warning for your area, take cover in a basement or small interior room. Stay away from windows and exterior walls and listen to NOAA Weather Radio to stay abreast of the changing weather situation. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. We're back now on this Agriculture Today and a few moments now for you producers who are committed to no-till crop production but find yourselves faced with potentially low pH soils that you're contending with and the opportunity to apply lime to those soils to correct that condition. Yet, with no-till in place, it does cause some complications compared to the way we normally lime fields. So what are your options here? We'll explore those now with Nutrient Management Specialist Dorval Ruiz Diaz of K-State Research and Extension. If it were a tilled field, it's very common for one to apply lime every few years or whenever the pH is low enough and incorporate that lime. Not so in this case, Dorbar. No, Eric, and that's one of the challenges in, in the case of a uh, uh, no-till or any reduced tillage even uh, systems where we are not incorporating this, this lime. And uh, we have to uh, keep in mind uh, how is this uh, low pH develop. And, uh, of course, uh, the main source of low pH is typically nitrogen fertilizer. So uh, in a system uh, of no-till system where uh, we may be putting most of the nitrogen fertilizer on the surface, then we tend to develop that low pH near the surface, and that may be two or three inches or so where we tend to have most of the extremely low pH in the profile. So that's something to keep in mind as we're talking about this issue in, in general. And again, the other side of, of, of this is that we are not going to incorporate typically because, of course, we are uh, doing a no-till no uh, system. So uh, a few things we need to keep in mind. Uh, maybe the first thing is uh, how do we soil sample this in this situation? And Again, our default uh, um, uh, recommended sampling depth for any immobile nutrient is typically 0 to 6 inches. But if we are dealing with a, a potentially low pH scenario in a no-till system, we will recommend a 0 to 3 inch sampling for pH. And this will be for pH only. Uh, all the other nutrients, we still do the 0 to 6. But in the case of pH and lime, we're going to be uh, looking at that 0 to 3 inches. Again, this is to have a better idea of what's the pH in that near the surface and have a better recommendation, but also to uh, keep in mind the lime application is, uh, of course, is going to be more likely surface ap- apply, and the effect of that lime is uh, probably going to be primarily in that upper two to three inches uh, as well. So that's the reason why we want to match that sampling depth also with what will be the effect of that uh, lime application. Now, the source of nitrogen one's been using on that field, that factors in here, does it not? Yes, um, and, and, and again, uh, the source of nitrogen will be one, one of those uh, factors contributing to uh, maybe a, a faster development of acidity over time. Uh, some sources like ammonium sulfate will tend to uh, generate more acidity. So all of those will be uh, factors, but also the soil type is is one key uh, component. Soils that tend to have lower CEC, more of a sandy soil type, those soils will tend to develop a city faster. And the reason for that is because the buffer of those soils tends to be 
be lower. And, and so that change in pH happened mo much faster. So, again, um, uh, producers dealing with maybe a little bit more uh, coarse textured soils, low cation exchange capacity soils, definitely should be checking pH uh, more often and, and keeping an eye on that. And, again, in the case of uh, no-till system, uh, definitely consider the uh, shallow sampling of 0 to 3 inches for a better pH estimate. So one samples and one determines that the pH is low enough for a lime application. It's in order here. How to place that lime? And once more, you're trying to maintain your no-till status here best you can. So this is a surface application by and large? Yes. Uh, we still uh, will recommend a lime application. And, and uh, in this case, again, uh, one thing that will change, of course, is uh, compared to a regular conventional tillage incorporated is the rate of lime that will be recommended. And again, if we are... Um, recommending lime for a conventional tillage or, or a system where we're going to incorporate that lime, then we're basically providing the full recommendation, if you will. And if we, we're dealing with a no-till system where we're going to surface apply, that lime is going to be interacting only with the upper two or three inches of the soil surface, then we're basically providing a recommendation of half the rate because, again, that lime is going to uh, react only with three inches rather than six inches, which will be the, the conventional system. So this is very important also for producers who are sending their samples out to the lab and requesting a recommendation. It's important to clarify if this lime is going to be incorporated or not because that basically means... 2x uh, difference in application rate if you are dealing with a conventional tillage versus a no-till system. So this is particularly important and one of those things that, again, as we are thinking about trying to get the best, the most accurate recommendation, producers who are no-till system uh, have to make sure and, and, and let the lab know about those characteristics, those conditions, and, and the plans for lime application. So again, uh, in general, a surface apply no-till system is, is, uh, works well, but again, we have to keep in mind that we're basically only going to be liming the upper two to three inches. So that's uh, the, the main factor. Uh, on the other hand, in a no-till system, maybe um, we, we found that uh, it's typically the what we need because the lowest pH will tend to be in that upper two to three inches as well. So that's really the, the main focus here in that no-till system. We really try to take care of that uh, extremely low pH condition that we may have near the surface. Although you note in the e-update article that covers this, by the way, recently posted that if it's been a while since that field was limed, say... 15, 20 years, there may be what are called acid zones deeper in the soil, but those aren't as critical to deal with, you say? Yes, that's a, that's a very good point, Eric. And, and yes, uh, we do have many fields in Kansas that will be easily 20, 25, or, or 30 years on the naughty systems. And, and yes, of course, the, the acidity will uh, basically slowly move in the profile, and we can have lower pH, uh, uh, lower in the, in the profile, say four or five inches. But again, the pH of that, uh, at those layers may not be as extreme. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, as long as the pH is not very low, uh, say close to 5, 5.2, where we start to have some uh, aluminum toxicity problems, then we will not see any uh, negative effect on plant growth and, and yields ultimately. So again, we go back basically to the main focus uh, being the, the upper uh, two or three inches in no-till systems. Well, again, when choosing a lime product, does it matter what one goes with to correct a low pH soil in continuous systems? When we uh, look in a uh, recommendation for lime, we typically uh, basically talk about pounds of effective calcium carbonate. So effective calcium carbonate basically puts all the, the different lime sources uh, in, in the same scale, if you will. And that's, uh, that's really the, the main thing that we need to look at when we are thinking about uh, application. In basically, all the different sources will be, uh, if we are doing applications based on effective calcium carbonate, it should be equivalent. Uh, of course, there are many um, different options out there, uh, things like uh, pelletized lime, for example, that essentially is a very high-quality lime. It's, it's not uncommon to uh, see more than 90% effective calcium carbonate uh, for that kind of product. So uh, very, very good quality lime and, and, and again, could be a, an excellent source for surface application in no-till. But, again, we... Uh, we still have to do this application based on, on, on the rates that we need. Uh, we basically cannot cut back the rates. We have to follow that recommendation based on effective calcium carbonate. So, again, uh, there are also other sources. Uh, for example, dolomitic limestone is, is one that 
uh, we often uh, talk about. And, and, and what that is is basically a lime source that will have some magnesium in addition to calcium. Uh, this source could be uh, um, useful in some situations, some soils that will be deficient in magnesium. That's typically not the case for us in Kansas. Uh, we really uh, are looking uh, to uh, basically correct the pH and not necessarily provide magnesium or calcium for that matter. Most of our soils also will tend to have good levels of calcium. So that type of, of, of source, again, um, uh, dolomitic limestone may not necessarily provide any additional benefit from most of our soils. And again, the regular calcium carbonates should be sufficient for, for what we need in terms of uh, a managing pH. Again, it's to be remembered that applying lime on a field is not an inexpensive proposition. So it really does come back door of our, doesn't it, to sampling appropriately to assure that you actually need to invest in that lime application? This is an excellent point, Eric, and, and I always emphasize this. Um, it's not a, a cheap um, amendment, uh, something that, of course, needed uh, every uh, few years, but definitely um, something that we need to make based on uh, good soil test information. And actually, um, if, if all possible, some producers, I think, should consider using grid sampling even uh, for variable rate lime application. One thing that is also very uh, particular about pH is the high variability that we can see in the field, uh, and especially uh, not-till fields that we are not mixing that soil, so we don't tend to contribute with uh, mixing that soil um, uh, over time. So again, we tend to see these very extreme differences within the field, and again, variable rate can be particularly beneficial in this case. And I will say, in my opinion, if any, uh, from any inputs or, or fertilizers, I will say lime is probably the, the most economical for variable rate application uh, in, in our soils. Well, Dorovar has authored an article on this very topic in a recent Agronomy e-update newsletter. What you're looking for, soil sampling for pH and liming in continuous no-till fields. It's in the May 11th edition of that e-update newsletter at agronomy.ksu.edu. Well, good input on this prospect of correcting low pH soils in continuous no-till systems. We appreciate the word, Dorvar. Thank you. Thank you. He's a nutrient management specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz on Agriculture Today, and we'll be back in a few moments with more on this, the K-State Radio Network. Here, in the breadbasket of America, not all Kansans are immune to hunger. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table, while one in 20 were unable to regularly provide food for their families. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this issue by helping low-income families learn about food safety, cooking skills, food resource management, and nutrition education. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. Some of these programs are even available in Spanish. Families who participate learn how to stretch their dollars, make their food budgets last longer, and eat healthy while still on a low budget. For more information about these programs or other K-State Research and Extension programs, go to www.ksre.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today, growing cover crops to enhance soil quality and nutrient cycling and suppress weeds and pests as part of a wheat production system is increasingly being considered by producers. However, the water requirements are a concern for growers in western Kansas. Since 2015, Kansas State University researchers have been evaluating cover crop management options in water-limited environments. They discussed their findings during a cover crop field day last Friday at the K-State HB Ranch near Hayes. K-State agronomist Augustina Bohr says that researchers are looking at growing a cover crop in place of fallow as part of the crop rotation system between wheat and sorghum. So we have two cover crop studies. One is spring planted and then the other is uh, summer planted. These cover crops are planted immediately after wheat harvest or we are planting the cover crop with some fallow period that we are replacing the sorghum in the following wheat. So instead of wheat sorghum fallow, we have wheat cover crop fallow, or we have wheat, immediately after wheat harvest, we plant our cover crop mix, and then 
The following year, we plant sorghum, and then it goes to fallow. One thing that we have noticed is that in our drier part of the state, when you grow a cover crop ahead of a wheat crop, the cover crop uses water that affects the subsequent wheat crop yield. So how can we grow these cover crops in our systems and take advantage of the benefit of the cover crop? One thing that we think you can do is to use the cover crop for forage. So that is what we are testing here. We are either harvesting our cover crops for forage as hay or we are grazing the cover crops. We planted a cover crop and hayed it. And then this treatment is a wheat after a cover crop that we grazed. And we planted it now to wheat in 2017 and we are going to harvest it shortly. One interesting thing, this crop looks way better considering the fact that we've been very dry. From October 1st up to now, we have about 4.8 inches of rainfall in total. Normally we will have about 10 to 12 inches between that time frame. So it's pretty dry, but the wheat looks very decent. And then one thing that we have been looking at is uh, when we planted these cover crops, uh, we harvest them for forage. Some of the forage yields that we have been getting, if you plant the cover crop right after wheat harvest, we are getting about um, 3,800 pounds per acre. But when we plant it, a full grown cover crop with some fallow period, you're getting about 7,000 pounds per acre on average. But the forage quality between when you plant after wheat or you plant a full grown cover crop are not different. When we planted cover crops immediately after wheat harvest, the following year, sorghum that we planted, the yields were about 15 bushels per acre less than when we had a wheat sorghum fallow rotation where you have wheat, you don't plant any cover crop, and the following year you plant sorghum, the yields were about 15 bushels per acre more than when we planted a cover crop after wheat harvest. Also, our summer cover crop, when you go north, is the other study where we are looking at spring cover crop. This is kind of the same setup. We have a wheat sorghum fallow rotation, but here we are planting our cover crops in the spring in the so into sorghum stubble. So we have been looking at the same kind of setup where we're looking at a cover crop. Either we plant it for forage, we hay it, or we graze it, or we leave it as cover. So we have 10 different cover crop treatments. We have old triticale mix, old triticale pea mix. We have old triticale buckwheat, radish, tunips, and then um, yeah, we have old triticale peas, buckwheat, tunips, and forage radish. That is a six-way mix. And then we have a single species of old spring triticale. And we planted this. We've been doing this since 2015 for over three years. And we've seen that um, the forage biomass yields are less than the summer cover crop. We are getting the highest yields we are getting is with the grasses, oat and triticale mix or triticale alone. We're getting about 3,000 pounds per acre average over the three years. Our cocktail mixes yields are lower. We get about 2,300 pounds per acre. So what we are seeing is uh, uh, the contribution, what is contributing to the biomass is the grasses. When you have more grass, you have grasses, then you have more yield. So when we decrease the proportion of the grass in the mixture, the biomass or forage production tends to be lower. However, our forage quality is higher where we have the legumes or the cocktail mixes that have broadleaf uh, uh, plants in it. So in terms of forage quality, it's a lot higher on the old triticale P plus. But the difference in protein concentration is about only 2%. We have about 14, roughly about 15% for the old triticale peas and then the old triticale mix has about 12 percent and for grazing of livestock that percentage crude protein even with the old triticale is pretty good and one thing you have to remember is we are harvesting this plot at the time of heading so as soon as it heads we harvest it so at that time it's not matured so the quality is better than when you leave it to matured one of the things that we are looking at is uh, when you grow this cover crop ahead of wheat, what is the impact on soil water content and the subsequent wheat crop yields? And we are also measuring soil health. So in terms of soil water, in 2015 when we started this, we had a very good rainfall. So we didn't see any impact of the cover crop on the subsequent soil water content at wheat planting. So that didn't affect the yields the following year in 2016. But in 2016, when we planted a cover crop, we have significantly less soil water 
compared to the fallow, and that affected our wheat yields in 2017. The wheat yields in 2017, the fallow plot was about 52 bushels per acre, compared to about 30, 35 bushels per acre for where we had the cover crop. And then we also look at the cover crop management impact on subsequent sorghum crop, and we are not seeing any differences in terms of sorghum yields. That is one year data, we didn't see any impact. And then when we graze the cover crop versus where we hid or we left it as cover, the difference in weed yields, there was not much different. They were similar yields. Where either we graze it, we hid, or we left it as cover. So we are not seeing any impact in terms of uh, yield. And then one other thing that we also look at is the potential for compaction when you graze these cover crops. Well, when we took the soil samples the first year, we saw some compaction, but it just in the top two inches on the graze plots. But in 2016 and 2017, we didn't see any impact, so bulk density. So there's the potential for compaction, but when it does occur, it just in the top two inches of the soil. And then one other thing we also measure is to look at, well, we have uh, legumes in the system. Do we increase... Uh, you have a mixture of legume, does it help to fix nitrogen in the system? Legumes do help fix nitrogen, but it depends on how much biomass you can produce. In our system, when we had the legumes, the actual soil nit residual nitrate in the soil was less than where we had the cover crop grass species. And the reason, I think, is just because of how much biomass we are producing. Because the legumes in our system, they came up, but they didn't grow big. They produced about 200 to 300 pounds per acre, dry matter. So in that case, you are not contributing that much to residual nitrogen. So in our systems, we're drier here. If the goal is to grow something as a biomass to provide cover, or something that you can graze or hay, then going simple, have a simple cover crop mixture. In our case, I think from our data, the oat and triticale mix or a single cover crop of triticale will provide you adequate biomass for grazing or adequate biomass for cover. So that is what we are doing and we will continue to monitor this. We are doing this long term and we are going to continue to monitor the soil quality aspects, looking at soil aggregate stability, uh, soil uh, organic carbon and then uh, potential mineralizable nitrogen from this uh, plus. One thing that I want to emphasize is in our dry land system, getting cover is very important. Getting some residue is very important because having a residue on the soil surface prevents the soil from blowing. And that also helps in building the soil organic matter content. So growing biomass, a cover crop measure that will give us adequate biomass to increase soil cover and also the residue will stay and build up the soil organic carbon is what we are looking after, not different 10 way mixes of cover crop where you have some of them come up, some will not come up, it doesn't grow big, and then you won't have enough biomass that will be able to provide adequate cover for your soil. We also measured infiltration rates in this spring cover crop treatments. We look at infiltration in the fallow plot versus. Um, where we had the old triticale that we grazed, and then where we had the six-way mix mixture. Well, we didn't see any difference in infiltration rate between the old triticale that we grazed and the cocktail. The infiltration rate is about uh, three centimeters per hour, and then the follow plus was about 1.9 centimeters per hour. So we are seeing a benefit of the cover crop, but the simple cover crop mixture did the same as where we have the complex six-way mixture. And the complex six-way speech mixture one thing we have to take note is the cost of these cover crops. The more measures you have, the greater the cost is going to, the seed cost is going to be. And oat and triticale mix, if the goal is to grow biomass, then that will be what I would do. That's K-State agronomist Augustina Bohr, one of the presenters at the cover crop field day at K-State's HB Ranch, about four miles south of the Cedar Bluff Dam near Hayes. This is the K-State Radio Network. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. 
To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. In today's agricultural news, according to the latest Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report, there were 5.3 days suitable for field work last week. Topsoil moisture rated 17% very short, 31% short, 48% adequate, and 4% surplus. Subsoil moisture supplies rated 18% very short, 37% short, 44% adequate, and 1% surplus. Winter wheat condition rated 15% very poor, 33% poor, 35% fair, 15% good, and 2% excellent. Winter wheat headed was 89%, that's behind 97% last year, and near 91% for the five-year average. Coloring was 15%, well behind 37% last year, and behind the 22% average. Corn condition rated 2% very poor, 6% poor, 35% fair, 49% good, and 8% excellent. Corn planted was 93%, ahead of 80% last year and the 88% average. Emerged was 81%, ahead of 62% last year and the 66% average. Soybeans planted was 65%, well ahead of 39% last year and the 37% average. Emerged was 42%, that's well ahead of 22% last year and the 18% average. Sorghum planted was 20%, ahead of the 10% average last year and the 14% average. Cotton planted was 62%, well ahead of 29% last year and the 25% average. Sunflowers planted was 16%, that's ahead of 4% last year and the 6% average. And pasture and range conditions were rated 8% very poor, 21% poor, 42% fair, 27% good, and 2% excellent. Well, dairy farmers have only until June 1st to apply for improved safety net under the Margin Protection Program, with many participants receiving payments beginning in early June. Rod Winkler with the USDA Kansas Farm Service Agency says dairy producers are encouraged to carefully weigh their options and enroll before the deadline passes. We're just wanting to remind producers, dairy producers, if they haven't had a chance to take a look at the new margin protection program, the vastly improved margin protection program, to please do so by Friday, June 1st. That's the final deadline to sign up. What are some of the changes that have been made? What are some of the improvements? Well, the Bipartisan Budget Act, Jeff, made a couple significant changes. One, that reduced the premium costs substantially. So the cost for buy-up coverage is substantially lower than it was under the previous program. The determination as to the price, the all-milk price, and the feed cost has been moved from a bi-monthly or every two months to monthly. So it has greater opportunity to trigger when when you can look at it on a monthly basis versus a bi-monthly or every other month basis. What type of changes need to be made if they go with this program? Any at all? Well, number one, I want to emphasize to the greatest extent I can, that if if producers signed up during the normal 2018 enrollment period and then the Bipartisan Budget Act was passed and and the program was changed, everyone needs to get in to sign a new agreement. So whether you signed up previously during the 2018 enrollment period or in prior years, it's still a voluntary program, but everyone must sign a new agreement by June the 1st, irregardless if they signed one previously. On top of that, Jeff, we already know, producers already know, the agreement basically says it's retroactive back to January 1st, and they know that the price of milk in February and March triggers payment levels. For example, if you do select the $8 buy-up coverage in February, you're going to be receiving a payment of $1.12 a weight. In March, it's going to be $1.24 a weight if you chose the buy-up coverage at the $8 level. So there are definitely advantages to getting into the office and getting this taken care of. Well, significant advantages because you you can look back and and, um, retroactively have coverage for months with 
where there's payments already made or going to be made based upon knowing what the price is. So we're, we're trying to make an effort to get producers to understand June 1, Friday, June 1 is the deadline. If they haven't signed an agreement after the new MPP was released, they have to sign a new agreement. Some are on the understanding that if they signed it previously, they're covered. They are not. They must sign a new agreement in the county office. So that's the main thing we want to stress. And they can just check with their local FSA office. Yes, they need to check in with their local USDA Service Center Farm Service Agency. That's Rod Winkler with the USDA Kansas Farm Service Agency. Again, dairy producers are encouraged to contact their local FSA office to make sure they're enrolled in the Improved Margin Protection Program for dairy before the June 1st deadline. And in May, USDA's Outlook Board takes a first look at the new marketing year and how global crops may impact U.S. markets. Rod Bain reports. It's one of the more important months on the calendar of the Agriculture Department's World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. May, the first look at the new marketing year. As World Agricultural Outlook Board Chair Seth Meyer explains by using Brazil and Argentina corn and soybean crops as an example. We're looking out in the future and it's absolutely important because when we look at the U.S. crop, we have to look at trade in the second half of the marketing year for the crop that will be harvested this fall. And that will be impacted by that crop we see in Brazil way out there. The farmers haven't even finished up the crop year in South America, so these tend to be highly speculative. But we put a marker out there so folks can see our entire projection and get a picture of what we're thinking. Weather also plays a part in long-term WASDE projections, such as USDA's first look at the 2018-19 Argentinian soybean crop. For instance, if we're dealing with a drought in Argentina, next year's production, we assume normal weather. So you'll see a big rebound in our initial thoughts for Argentine production. That's a return to more normal yields, which is the big driver there of adding 17 million metric tons in Argentina. The May WASDE contains similar coverage of how one country's crop can impact the U.S. in terms of markets. Russia's 2018-19 wheat crop is forecasted near record production, yet a much smaller crop than the previous year's record. Meyer says despite that, Russia was the world's largest wheat exporter last year at almost 40 million metric tons. So with the new marketing year... Despite the fact that they're going to have a little bit smaller of a crop in 1819 and export 3 million metric tons less at 36.5 million metric tons, that'll keep them the number one wheat exporter in the world. And this first WASD for the new marketing year brings together an initial cumulative preview of supply and demand trends. So Meyer says for 2018-19... It's consumption exceeding production for most crops with the exception of rice, and even then, growth in rice stocks isn't very large. So it's declines in global carryout stocks for corn, for soybeans, for wheat, for sorghum, for barley, and cotton. We look out and we see tightening global supplies for all those commodities. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. This is the K-State Radio Network. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. Annika found a dead bird on the concrete walk in front of the big glass sliding doors. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Each evening, well into dusk, the pair of indigo buntings keep returning to the feeder for another quick dash to pick a few sunflower seeds. As it gets darker, the dark feather coat of the male loses its luster, and the brownish female blend in with the approaching evening. With the sunlight during the day, the male looks deep and shiny blue. We enjoy them as they visit the feeder. My wife and I point them out to each other as the tiny birds dart in and out. Compared to the cardinal, they are small. But surprise and sadness when I came home the other morning and I found on my desk, placed on a white napkin, 
the body of a male indigo bunting. I don't know if it was our friend who entertained us. I feel very disappointed and sorry for its mate. Most likely, she will have the job of egg-sitting and raising her young on her own. Annika found a dead bird on the concrete walk in front of the big glass sliding doors. He must have flown smack into the clear glass and died instantly. When Annika picked him up, he was still warm. You can't fly through the house, even though that may be the shortest way to the feeder. Big windows are always a problem and often a death trap for flying birds, especially so if they are escaping from a bird of prey. But I don't know what caused this bird to fly into the glass. To try to prevent this from happening, we have a few items hanging behind the large glass panels. I'm sure it helps, but this time it was not enough to protect that bunting. Sad. The next few days we will be on the lookout for the female. It's a brownish bird with some lighter feather markings. Our brushy hill landscape must be an ideal habitat for the bunting as it likes abundant farmland, old pastures and edges grown up into shrubs adjacent to open fields. A few weeks ago I mowed the grassy hill. Apparently the indigo bunting does not have blue pigment, but are actually black. The blue is caused by diffraction of light through the feathers. That explains why, as dusk approaches, the birds blend in and are harder to see. But whatever, my blue friend is dead, and his partner must be mourning. To raise a nest with young is quite a task. I found a few birds' nests this spring, for instance a gardener's nest in the middle of my brush pile, which was ready to be burned. I will wait, it's burning. I keep looking for the indigo burning's nest as I walk the hill. They have to lead me to it. It's a compact nest woven of leaves and grass and placed relatively close to the ground, often no more than a few feet. They prefer thick vegetation, which makes them harder to find. I may have to wait until next winter or late fall when the leaves have fallen and grasses have dried up. But there are plenty of places here on the hill where such a nest could be constructed never to be found. And it proves my point that most songbirds' nests are built from four to eight feet high off the ground. And that is why the landscape of the hill here is planted, or should I say, is allowed to grow as it is. Great bird habitat, and they have rewarded us by coming and staying. What is the saying? If you build it, they will come? The trouble is, we now must keep them alive. I took the dead bird to the pony stables and placed the blue body on a big fence post as an offering to the buzzards, which live there and are nesting inside. They are brooding two large white eggs. I made the simple offering as nature, back to nature. The buzzards, or vultures, have to eat too. And even though this tiny blue shining bird is not a big meal, I expect it to be snatched up from the fence post and consumed. It surely is not a meal to share with the whole family. It's a very small bird. But waste not, want not. Another old saying. The next time I see the vultures sweep low over the hill and being carried upwards again on the air current and then see him or her lazily flap its wings once, maybe twice, I'll say that was the momentarily energy of the dead and consumed in the gobunting. Energy not wasted. Our place, close to four acres, is about the average territory needed for the bunting. When they return from overwintering south, they tend to return to the same territory of previous years. I have observed the birds before. Initially, I might even have mixed them up with the bluebird. This year, I took a closer look. 
Maybe I'm drinking more tea on the deck. If this first brood is going to be a failure, I'm hoping for a second brood and that she finds another male bird. It is the female which is all the nest building. She collects and builds the nest. What makes finding the nest difficult is that the female is extremely secretive in approaching her nest. They come and go from several directions. Three to four white eggs are placed in the nest. The incubation period is 12 days and done by the female only. The nestling phase is 10 to 12 days and fledging two to three weeks. In the fledging stage, both the female and the male feed the young birds. Late in the summer into fall, the buntings fly south in large flocks to overwinter where there are wheat seeds and grain is to be found. They winter in South Florida, Central America, and further south. They will return in April and May, flying at night. That means that the dead bird Annika picked up only recently had come north again. I hope the female bird will brood out the young. And I also hope they like ticks, those quick, running, nasty pests. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.